Welcome back to another Python tutorial. This is part six of our series on clustering stocks using Python. So in our last video, we, we basically fitted our model a little bit and then we actually did our silhouette analysis. So the purpose of the silhouette analysis was basically to help us determine the optimal number of clusters because with k means k means doesn't come out and tell you hey this is the k that you need to use this is the one that's going to work best it is assumed that we know how many k's there needs to be um, if we don't know there are some techniques we can use to help determine what k should be but we do have to recognize that these methods while they do help us are not perfect and so sometimes we have to take their results with a grain of salt but what we determined was two to three clusters, it seemed to make sense. Um, me personally, I was leaning more towards three. I'm sure some of you might disagree with that. You might say, Alex, I'm gonna go with two. By all means, go with two. Um, so what we're gonna do in this video is we're gonna take our model and we're gonna plot the label. So now we're gonna create a scatter plot where each cluster is labeled. So we're gonna have you know the group one, group two, and so on and so on. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna basically take our scatter plot that we made up above. And keep in mind, sometimes these numbers might be a little different. So you might go say, like, hey, Alex, in previous videos, you know, it was X, Y, Z. Um, I did break this up over a couple of days. And because of that, um, there is a good chance that um, the data could have changed because things like earning reports come out and all sorts of stuff. And that can obviously impact certain things like ROE and ROA and everything like that. So we might just be seeing the latest numbers. So if you're seeing different numbers, don't freak out. There is a good reason for that. And then I'm also gonna take this guy right here because what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a scatter plot for each basically scenario of clusters. So here we had two and three. We're gonna stick with that one. We're gonna take this <clears throat> and we're gonna define a couple new components. First thing I'm gonna do is I am gonna create a line break so it's a little bit easier to read. And then from here, I do need to create uh, an instance of my k-means model again. I mean, technically I could be taking it from that dictionary if I wanted to, but um, you know, just for demonstration purposes and so you can see the same thing over again, let's just do it again, right? <laughs> no, it's okay. Okay, and we'll put random state zero and then we will fit it. And so we'll say x, train robust so we're going to take our scale data so create an instance of the model obviously there's multiple ways to do this but me personally i like this now what we do need is i want to plot each um center so each uh each like centroid and so what we're going to do is we're going to take our cluster centers and we're going to assign them and so what we're going to do is we're going to define our clusters and we're going to say cluster centers equals k means and then there is a cluster centers property and so we're going to define c1 and that's going to equal cluster centers and we're going to take uh what is it first column all the rows and i'm just going to copy this a couple times and I'm going to do C2, C3, and then this will be 1 and 2. Okay, so this stays the same, this stays the same, this stays the same, but we do have to change one of these a little bit. So what we're going to do here is we're going to change our colors to be K means dot labels underscore, and then we have to do as type float it does expect a float the reason why is it comes to our particular um what is it our our, ma our color mapping and so we're going to say color mapping equals i found winter is a very nice one it kind of helps uh, nice high contrast where you can easily distinguish each one and then so that plots our data and it colors it but now we need to plot our centroids and so we're going to do c1 c2 and c3 we're gonna set the marker equal to X, and then I want a very high contrast color so I can see it. And so I'm gonna set that equal to red. And with that being said, we have one other thing, which is the title. And so we'll say define the title. 
And so that's going to be plot.title uh, visualization of clustered data with blank clusters. And then we're going to do format clusters, or sorry, cluster. And then I want the font. Oh, wait, no, I need to put this outside of it, comma. I want the font weight weight to be bold. Hopefully that's everything. Again, if you saw the scatter plot video where I did up above, everything is the same. We really are just adding this component and then we're adding the this component right here. For the most part though, everything's exactly the same. Okay, so it might be kind of hard to tell. Unfortunately, those centroids can sometimes get hidden underneath the data, but hopefully you can see that little red X there. Unfortunately, I can't really tell where it is in the dark blue one. But from here, this is with two clusters, and then this is with three clusters. To me, it, I mean, it's broken. There's, there's obviously some structure. What I kind of don't like is like this one down here, it's very dense, and it's like it starts out very dense, and then it kind of just moves out, moves out, moves out, and like becomes more and more spread out. But if I did have to say... Could I see where this made sense? Yes, to a certain extent. If you remember in an earlier video, I did kind of mention, imagine the scenario of this. You have some companies that you might consider are, you know, subpar. They might don't, they don't kind of deliver well on either metric. Um, you have some that maybe do relatively well. I mean, not great, not bad. These are kind of like what you would call maybe your average scenario. And then you've got like your rock stars who just like crush it in every category. Um, you know, you would have to do further analysis to kind of conclude that, but this might help uh, narrow down which ones you would maybe want to focus on more. Um, and then naturally, you know, as you add in more attributes, you might see a very different type of clustering. Obviously, the more attributes you add into it, you could see very different clustering. But with that being said, it makes sense. Some people might disagree and say, oh, maybe that's not good enough and this and that. There's techniques that potentially you could do to maybe help mitigate that problem. But the reality is we just don't have those spherical um, clusters that we'd like to see sometimes with k-means. Um, I'll kind of expl explain at the end of the video, sometimes it maybe makes sense to use a different clustering algorithm than k-means. But for most people, it's a very easy one to understand. And so naturally, that's the first one they kind of stick to at first. And then from there, you know, if they find something different, they might um, approach it a little bit differently. So that's um, that's plotting it. Let's do it with the PCA data set and see if we see anything kind of, you know, drastically different. Um, but we do have to, you know, obviously change some stuff. And I've got to move my notes. Okay, PCA data set. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to select that. And then I'm going to say this this and I'm going to say PCA underscore data set. I don't need the third one because there is no third one. I don't need the third one because there is no third one. I don't need that. I don't need that. I don't need that. That's fine. That's fine. I'm going to try it with this. Oh, that's right. I got to change this too. Uh, what is it? Principal component one. Or right, you know what? I think I labeled it differently. I got to check how I labeled it. I forgot. <laughs> component one. Okay. So it's component one. Um, and then this one is component two. All righty. Cool. Oh, it's doing a 3D one. It doesn't need to be 3D. And now there are, ugh. Ooh, I hope that doesn't, oh, I know what it is. Sorry, I was rushing a little bit. It just needs to be the plot. And then I'm just going to change that. So that's fine. That's fine. 
that's fine. Hopefully no errors. And okay, there we go. See, I knew eventually it would work. <laughs> okay, so with the PCA one, remember that's a dimensionality reduction technique. So we're taking our three dimensional data set and we're basically compressing it down to two dimensions. So that's why we need a two dimensional scatter plot now because we're no longer having that third dimension. But you can tell for the most part, the structure is relatively the same. I mean, it's pretty much identical. Um, it might be a little bit easier to tell kind of which it is. The nice thing is, you know, each one of these are kind of centered, which you would expect. You know, the centroid should be kind of the average of all the distance within that particular cluster. But again, it, it's kind of telling that same story, which is like right down here, it's super kind of, I would say, tight and clustered, where this one, as you're moving out, it's kind of spreading further and further out. And that's why this one might have few data points, because Again, it's kind of all over the place now. It's not kind of tightly compact. So, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this is kind of what you would consider average. And then as you're moving further and further out, you know, you kind of get this more spread out variance. It's, it's, it's kind of saying like, hey, now you're starting to see these kind of crazy wackiness with the different types of ratios. Again, it, you know, it's kind of up to interpretation. What I will say is remember up with this silhouette analysis where I said, hey, like, you know, look here, like these ones, these are kind of the, they're stuck on both decision boundaries. That's basically what's happening right here. You can see that these ones, these would basically be considered the outliers because they fall in between the two decision boundaries. And so with these ones, you've got a bunch of them. Here it's not too bad, but it's basically saying there's potentially outliers that exist within those two decision boundaries. And so naturally, I'd like to see this be smaller because what that is telling me is it's again, more distinct. You've got these more distinct clusters that exist there, but that sometimes is challenging with the data. But if that is the data, there are sometimes techniques that we can use in a different type of clustering algorithm that maybe makes a little bit more sense. So with that being said, let's move to our last topic, which is you've got this model. Maybe you want to start making predictions, right? So grab the model and we're going to make some predictions. So we're going to add in some you know, new data, right? And so really all you have to do is you just take three, you take your model, and from here, so this is basically taking that dictionary aspect that I did up above. So this is where we can take it. Um, we grab the, the third cluster, so K equals three, and we grab the model for that particular cluster. I have some test data here. Again, these are some just made up, you know, ROE, ROI, and ROA. And then we can make some predictions. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to say k means dot predict. So if I pass through my test data, what would it give me out? Oh, it's an S. Oh, what happened? Oh, I know what I did. Well, that was foolish of me. <laughs> I always do something that messes it up. So I, instead of doing results dictionary PCA, I overwrote <laughs> the other one that I did, which was my bad. But you know what I can do? Because I'm lazy and I just want to do it again. We'll run this one again. And so that should override our old one. Yeah, you should probably rename it. Okay, perfect. And so basically it's saying for these two ones, they would belong in uh, cluster two. So the far one. All right, so final notes. What should we talk about? Um, there might be an additional video, I'm not really sure. I might go more into the mathematics behind the actual model, just because some people might be curious like mathematically what's going on. I'm assuming at this point that for the most part, the explanation is enough. Uh, you know, there are obviously resources you can leverage and things like that, but this is actually one of those nice algorithms where it's pretty easy to grasp. It's not like anything super complicated, uh, but the real power behind it, like I said before, is you can take a data set that doesn't have any labels or categories, and now you can start basically creating categories from it. You know, there are some assumptions about that particular data, but 
you know, sometimes, you know, we don't have a perfect data set. And so it's just things that I would consider, you know, especially after doing this, that I would maybe look into. They are very dense or it's, it's not that they're dense, but you have this one dense cluster and then you got this kind of like spread out one. So there are kind of density based clustering algorithms that can kind of control for that. And so they're going to treat the, the clustering a little bit differently. Me personally, I would be curious. This would be kind of my next step after doing this. Like, well, how would it perform with something that you see this kind of wide variety with the density of the actual clusters? Does that give us any better of a score? Does that kind of improve? Does it does it tell a different story? So for me, after doing this, that would be kind of my next step. Would be, hey, well, if we try a different type of clustering algorithm, does it make sense? Does it tell that is the data a little bit? better fit to that particular algorithm or is it just still the same story? Um, and then also something too is it's how would filtering the results? Remember in the earlier videos that I talked about, you know, how we use outliers and remove them and stuff like that. How does that impact our actual model? Um, I will say you get sometimes very different results depending on how you filter the data. Um, there were situations where when I set this, like, I think it was like to 60 or something like that, you actually got a higher silhouette score. And so maybe that's a that might be a better one. So it, again, it's a judgment call sometimes. You might have to ask that question, you know, is an ROE above 60 unrealistic or something like that or, or things along that nature. So it's hard, it, it really is a judgment call sometimes, but you know, you do have the luxury of where you can iterate. I mean, you've got kind of a platform now where the structures here, the steps have been defined for you go out and experiment a little bit. Try changing the arrangement of the different attributes that you have. Change how you filter them. See if you get something different. You might be surprised. There might be a better combination of metrics that work better, but ideally when you're doing this, these are kind of the steps that you want to be doing, and this is how you want to be evaluating your model and, and things that you need to be thinking about. Um, a lot of times there's not necessarily these clean data sets that we can just like, oh yeah, you know, like the iris data set. I mean, yeah, I could have done the iris data set, but there's no fun in that. Everyone's done that one before. So I, to me, I like kind of using more real world examples. And with that, you can actually kind of say, hey, you know, data isn't perfect. And there's things that we can do to kind of help fix that. Uh, and then another thing that might make sense too with this particular data structure is maybe it doesn't make sense to use a very spherical based clustering algorithm. Maybe we should explore and see, does a clustering algorithm that, uh, where there's not kind of these nice spherical clusters, does it do better with this type of data? Do we get a more clear structure and grouping compared to k-means? These are options that we have access to if we want. So this is again, just kind of a wrap up and things to think about. This is by no means kind of the end point in a sense, but it's kind of saying, okay, this is what we found so far. We'd be kind of curious to see what happens after this. So again, if you have any questions, please put them down in the comments below. You know, I'll obviously try to answer them if I can. Um, like I said, there might be like an appendix video that goes more through the mathematics, but at this point, that's really the end of this particular series. So hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Hopefully you found it useful. And you know, I'm not saying you're gonna get rich off of it by any means, but you know, maybe now you can start taking your data sets and doing something with a little bit with it now. And, you know, I'll start exploring if I feel like there's uh, maybe it kind of calls for doing a, another series where we use a different type of clustering algorithm. I'll definitely explore that. If you guys want to see that, by all, by all means, you know, please put them in the comments. Um, but I think kind of in our next one, we're probably going to be covering either K nearest neighbors or a random forest classifier. So we got like two or three more machine learning models and then we're gonna go to neural networks at some point. So that's gonna be the fun stuff, right? <laughs> that's always the hot topics. So uh, thanks again for watching everybody. We will see you in the next video.